Hi everyone, my name is Lee Pucker. I'm the CEO of the Wireless Innovation Forum, and I'd like to welcome you to the second of our uh, webinar of our uh, Tech Talk series. Uh, today's webinar is entitled uh, Take My Network to the Moon, and I'll do a few administrative notes at the beginning and then turn it over to the moderator. So first, uh, the slides that are uh, presented during the webinar are going to be posted at wirelessinnovation.org uh, slash webinars. And we're recording this webinar. The webinar will be on the WinForms YouTube channel, and there will also be a link again at wirelessinnovation.org slash webinars. Uh, if you have any questions about the webinar or, or any of the series, uh, please feel free to contact me. You can send an email to lee.pucker at wirelessinnovation.org, and I'll be happy to help you out. Uh, during the uh, presentation today, if you have questions for the presenter, please type them into your questions window. Uh, it should be, uh, there's a questions window on your interface. Uh, type them in there, I'll pass them on to the, to the moderator and we'll, we'll make sure your questions get answered as we go. Any questions that don't get answered, uh, we'll try to answer offline at the end. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to today's moderator. Uh, the moderator today is Andy Clegg. He's the Spectrum Engineering Lead at Google, and he's the Chief Technology Officer of the Wireless Innovation Forum. So, Andy, over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lee. Um, so this is the second in our relatively new series of Tech Talk webinars that Wireless Innovation Forum is doing. Um, what we're reserving these Tech Talk webinars for are things that are so super cool in the wireless innovation domain that they're worthy of their own uh, webinars that we provide here through Wireless Innovation Forum. We had one several weeks ago on the development of what's becoming the first potentially practical quantum receiver um, being developed at NIST. Um, the video of that presentation is available on our website. Uh, that was a fascinating talk. And this second in the series is equally fascinating, and that's the concept of taking a uh, wireless network um, and deploying it on the moon. Uh, we don't have any tech talk, any additional tech talk seminars uh, scheduled right at this moment because we're waiting to find, you know, just there's that combination of really super cool and innovative activity. Um, but today we're very honored to have uh, Thierry Klein. He's the president of Bell Lab Solutions Research. Um, and he's going to talk, uh, Nokia Bell Lab Solutions Research, he's going to talk about uh, their work on uh, launching and deploying uh, a network, a wireless network on the moon. And I'm going to let Thierry introduce himself because based on his bio, he's done a million things. Um, so he'll give you a rundown on what he's done and then we'll move to the presentation. And again, thank you very much, Thierry, for presenting and we look forward to the talk. Thank you, Andrew, and, and thank you, Lee, for the, uh, for the invitation. Um, before I share my slides, maybe... Uh, following what you suggested i describe a little bit what uh what what i've been doing uh, i'm currently president of bell Labs solutions research and as you may know bell Labs is the research arm of of nokia right now um actually it's always been the research arm of whoever mother was the mother company through the mergers and acquisitions in the telecom industry and um, the mission of my organization is really to do research uh that expand the portfolio of the company uh, we do research that's in, in line with the portfolio of the company, mostly focused on the networking side. My team is focused on new technologies, uh, new markets, new customers, new applications uh, that go beyond networking. And, and how can we develop product, solution, services that would expand Nokia's portfolio? So we look a lot of uh, AI, um, Web3, robotics, drones, and then new, uh, new use case, new scenarios that are outside of the typical uh, telecom uh, markets, uh, a lot focused on enterprise industrial. And uh, throughout my career, I've done a number of different things. Started as uh, an information theorist, communication theorist, worked on uh, 3G uh, networks, but uh, expanded to more and more system research uh, over the years. I've done an internal venture in the company. I've worked on and led our energy efficiency research program. Um, and then, uh, but Seven years ago, started looking more at the enterprise industrial applications, and um, and uh, always interested in in sort of the extreme uh, problems. From uh, the Bell Labs DNA is is kind of looking at the extreme version of a problem, 
and then looking back at um, how do I make progress towards that. And that's actually what led us to also think about can we deploy a network on the moon? And I'm very, very excited to share with you what we're doing and why we're doing it and what are some of the, the research engineering challenges and how are we overcoming coming those to deploy a network on the moon. Um, so with that, I will uh, share my screen, my slides. Uh, let me know. Uh, I assume whoop, I assume you can see my slides. If if not, yeah, uh, please, see, please let me know. Okay, perfect. So um, the title is Communications in Extreme Environments. And so we think of uh, there are a lot of extreme environments on Earth where we deploy communication networks, whether it's a, a mine, an oil rig, or um, a remote wind farm, and so forth. And we started thinking about what are extreme environments on Earth where we need to deploy networks. And we started thinking, what's the most extreme environment we can think of? And we thought the moon is a pretty extreme environment. So why don't we try and uh, see how we can build a network for that extreme environment in a sense, if we can deploy the network on the moon um, with the extreme challenges that you face there, we can definitely build networks for the most extreme environments on, on Earth. Um, and just maybe a, a little bit uh, on, on Bell Labs, as I, I mentioned, uh, we are the research arm uh, for, uh, for Nokia right now, and, and we've done a lot of industrial research uh, over the last 95 years, close to 100 years, and, and a lot of core innovations in our industry, in the information communication technologies industries, have started with, uh, with Bell Labs. And I'm just listing a few here that are uh, quite well known, starting with the transistor, but also looking at satellite communication, uh, fiber optics, uh, concept of cellular communication, uh, solar cells, and I'm mentioning these because uh, they're relevant to the particular project uh, that I'm, I'll be describing, but also, uh, of course, Unix, C, C++ were invented in, the, in, the, in Bell Labs. So quite a, bit of, um, quite a bit of a track record on industrial research, but we've always looked at what are the most challenging problems of the generation. And um, keeping in mind that we operate in an industrial context, but really trying to understand what are the fundamental limits, what are the fundamental trends that we uh, we we see, and how do we overcome uh, limitations or uh, negative trends to uh, to continue to uh, to innovate and provide solutions that are relevant to how we live, how we work, how we operate, both in our personal or professional lives. Um, and we've always looked at uh, space exploration. So this project that I'll be describing to you is not the first time that we've been uh, innovating in, in space. Uh, we have a number of projects uh, that are relevant to space exploration that Bell Labs uh, has been involved in historically. Um, the most famous uh, one, maybe uh, I'll, I'll mention two here. Uh, first one is um, just inventing the science of radio astronomy, uh, which was really born in, in Bell Labs in the 1930s. Uh, maybe one of the most famous ones is is really the work that uh, Arno Penzias and Bob Wilson have done in the um, uh, several decades back that really proved the theory of the Big Bang uh, by discovering the cosmic background radiation, and they won the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, for that in 1978. Um, we've also uh, mentioned the solar cell, which was instrumental in, uh, it was the first practical uh, solar cell that was developed in, in Bell Labs and was really important for a lot of space communication, um, primarily the Telstar satellite, which is the first communication satellite uh, built by Bell Labs in 1962. Um, we all know Sputnik as the first um, artificial satellite, but Telstar was the first communication satellite. And um, the solar cell, which was developed in, in Bell Labs several years before, proved very important to be able to operate the Telstar satellite. And um, so it was that fundamental communication challenge and fundamentally, how do we communicate across across the the, um, the oceans that led us to consider satellite communication. Um, but then a lot of other fundamental technologies were important and required to make um, satellite communication practical. And, and the solar cell coupled with satellite was one good example of how different technologies that each have a lot of uh, innovation and a lot of merit in their own right were critical to um, to come together for this first transatlantic television uh, link. Um, going a little bit close, and there's a lot of, uh, I should say, there's a number of other uh, examples uh, that Bell Labs has 
been involved in space communication. We've been part of Project uh, Mercury. We've been part of Project Apollo. Um, I, I don't um, have time to go through those, but uh, throughout the history of VELAPS, we've always been connected to space industry from a, from a technology uh, perspective. Uh, but I just wanted to mention these few examples here. When we get a little bit closer to communication and more recently, uh, we've done a lot of research um, in building compact and ultra compact networks. And if you look at the middle of the slide here, you see um, a, a wireless network in a backpack. And, and this was really key. It's a key step for us to build integrated, very lightweight compact networks that can be deployed very quickly. Um, I, I mentioned that I've done an internal startup in the company and that was actually around a rapidly deployable network that can be deployed very quickly by emergency responders, very small, very integrated, um, very quick deployment anywhere, anytime where you need the network. Um, and while that had a different use case, it's also that kind of solution that you need if you want to deploy solutions on, on balloons and, and airborne and space, uh, space applications. So we've been part of Project Loon, where the uh, the small cell and and um, the um, the integration of the compact network was part of um, part of um, Project Loon. So we've done a lot of uh, a lot of these kind of experiments, and this was really maybe the first stepping stone towards building a, a space uh, space grade network. Um, then back in 2017 2018, we are part of a project called Mission to the Moon. Uh, and this was driven by several European partners um, led by Vodafone, Audi, and the German space startup called PT Scientist. And, and the initial ambition from that was to, to really build the first cellular network on the moon, uh, build the first LTE network on the moon. It was um, intended to go back to the Apollo 17 landing site and coincide with the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 17 landing. Um, and, uh, and really established the first LTE network on the moon, deploy several, uh, two lunar rovers that would explore the lunar surface and send um, real-time video, HD video back uh, back to Earth. Um, and that was really the starting point where we were selected by Vodafone to be the network uh, provider for, and, and built this network from, a, from an infrastructure perspective. Um, unfortunately, that mission never, never materialized um, never happened uh, for a number of reasons um, that were outside of our control, really. But in the process, we had built the network. So we established a lot of experience and um, did a lot of design, engineering, development, and testing for this kind of network, which really opened up a lot of doors for us for the current mission that we're, uh, that we're working on with NASA and, and other partners. Um, so now th that's a little bit the the background and, and maybe the historical context on this, this current project with NASA to deploy the first cellular network on the moon. Um, and you'll also see the connection to LTE and why we pick LTE first versus a 5G um, solution. But now I want to take a little bit of a step back uh, saying what is actually happening in, in, in NASA. And when you look at NASA and the lunar program, there's really two programs. The first one that, that you're probably very familiar with is the Artemis program. Um, which is um, uh, really has the ambition to uh, to to bring back uh, humans to the to the moon, uh, first person of color, first uh, woman on the moon, and really establish a sustained presence on the moon, and then prepare for missions to Mars. That's sort of the I'd say the commercial production uh, program to go back to the moon. And uh, fingers crossed for uh, for next Monday when Artemis One is is now scheduled to launch. And then there is the NASA Tipping Point, which is a, a separate program that is supposed to feed technologies into the Artemis program, but is really looking to develop new technologies, advance technologies, as the name suggests with Tipping Point, the technologies that have a certain level of maturity, but are not quite ready for the commercial deployments. And NASA is interested in supporting and funding these projects to, to advance them to the point that they could be integrated in the Artemis program. So communication definitely falls under that that category and, and our project is supported under this NASA tipping point. So while we're not directly part of the Artemis program, the ambition is to advance the technologies far enough that um, uh, 3GPP type technologies and cellular networks can be considered for future um, Artemis missions to the moon and to Mars. 
But the other thing that's also happening at the same time in NASA is they're really looking more and more for private, I would say private public partnerships. And you see this very much with what they're doing with SpaceX. NASA is not building rockets themselves anymore. They're not looking to, uh, they're not, uh, they're supporting and funding the missions, but it's different entities that, that are, um, that are building the solutions and flying the mission. So they're looking much more at leveraging investments and developments that happen in, in the, in private industry and leverage that for, um, for commercial uh, purposes in, in the space industry. So in a sense, you can say there's a, um, a mindset shift to go from customized proprietary purpose-built solutions to more towards uh, services, NASA contracting with private industry and leveraging investments that are already made in private industry to and, and leverage those benefits and those advantages for the space. The same thing is then happening from a, from a communication side. What has been happening with rockets and spacecraft and missions, NASA is also interested in leveraging more and more all the investments that the telecom industry has made in in developing and deploying the most advanced communication networks in the world and saying all of those technologies have been developed, they're being used by several billion people on Earth. How can we leverage those same technologies for space applications rather than develop new communication technologies from scratch and that would still not meet the investment needs that have been made by the telecom industry? So all those things were coming together at at really the right time for us. We've developed experience in building these these compact networks. We've been part of a first mission to try and deploy a network on the moon. At the same time, NASA is interested in <clears throat> leveraging the investments that companies like us and others in our industry have made. So it's really the the right time, and uh, we we're very fortunate to I'd say to be at the right place at the right time with the technologies that we've developed and um, the ambition from NASA to look at new communication technologies. So now you can you can ask. Uh, by the way, if there are any questions, uh, please. Um, I cannot see the chat window, so Andrew or Lee, please just uh, just interrupt me if there are any questions uh, on the chat. None yet that I see. Okay, wonderful. Um, so now you can say why would we why would you want to use LTE or 5G for space communication? Um, and I think there's an, there's a number of advantages. Um, the the main advantage is really it's um, certainly LTE and 5G more and more. It's a mature, proven technology. Um, over 4 billion people use LTE globally, um, and that number is probably higher. This is maybe a couple of years uh, old statistic. Uh, there's a lot of technology investment that's been made. It's it's deployed in a lot of uh, scenarios around the world. So it's really the most advanced, most mature communication technology that we have. Um, and then you can see some of the uh, technology benefits as far as scalability of the of the communication capabilities as far as bandwidth throughput so forth is concerned low latency communication uh, mo supports mobility supports uh, quality of service applications and so forth so a lot of technology benefits that are driven by the the needs of all of us as consumers uh, so it's it's a, a lot of investment billion dollars investment have gone into this technology and it's it's quite robust quite mature and and validated by a lot of a lot of people every day i think that's the the main the main benefit for going on a 3gpp cellular communication path rather than proprietary technology path so now how would you use uh this what are some of the use cases that we foresee for uh for space communication um i'm i'm going to list just uh eight scenarios here but uh, you can probably imagine uh, a number of other scenarios where communication will be really important. Um, the first one is when we talk about the, the moon, we think about lunar surface communication. So how do you establish a communication network around the landing site where a mission will be deployed? If you have a habitat on lunar surface, how do you allow astronauts to communicate with each other, communicate with machines, communicate with um, robots, communicate with sensors, um, uh, around locally around the, the habitat uh, where they're they're stationed um, astronaut to astronaut communication astronaut to lander communication um, if we deploy scientific experiments and sensors how do we collect the information from uh, from those sensors if we have um, robots or, or rovers where the astronauts are exploring the lunar surface um, those 
those machines, those rovers have to be connected back to the land, they have to be connected back to to the astronauts. Ultimately, all of the communication has to be sent back to a mission control center uh, on Earth, whether it's direct communication or through orbital platforms. Uh, you can imagine uh, gateways or uh, satellites in lunar orbit that function both as a relay between separate non-connected um, habitats or as a relay back to, uh, to mission control. And then ultimately you have spacecrafts in, uh, in lunar orbit. Uh, there's also the communication capabilities that are required between um, spacecraft and um, astronauts, maybe for extra vehicular activities and so forth. Um, so we see a lot, of, uh, a lot of these use cases, a lot of applications, but what I want to also convey to you is that when you think about these scenarios, they're not that different from enterprise uh, scenarios on Earth. If you imagine that this picture would represent a mine in, uh, in a remote area in Australia and you ask what communication is needed in, uh, in and around the mine, you also have uh, workers that need to communicate with voice, video, data. You have maybe autonomous uh, trucks, autonomous machines that, that are controlled, um, people communicating with the machines, sensors uh, deployed to collect information. Um, and, and then you have to communicate to a remote, um, remote environment, a remote control, uh, control center. So when we, when we really look at and, and how we imagine a future deployment on lunar surface, except the, the harsh environment, operationally and from a communication perspective, it's not that different from an environment that we envision for industrial and enterprise scenarios on Earth. As I said, it's, it's extreme from a number of perspectives, but not from the kind of communication requirements you have, the kind of use cases you have, and then the, the throughput latency uh, and so forth is, is concerned. Uh, so that's why we, we think of the moon as really an extreme environment of an enterprise uh, terrestrial environment, and we can, can really develop a network for that extreme environment based on the networks that you have for um, enterprise terrestrial networks, but then the lessons learned can also come back uh, for, uh, for terrestrial environments. So we really see this as going from Earth to the moon in the sense of expanding the network capabilities to uh, lunar surface communication, developing new capabilities, but then also bringing the lessons learned back to Earth. Um, so there's kind of a nice going to the moon and back um, analogy here. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with um, LTE, um, 4G, 5G networks. So I just want to talk a little bit about what such networks look like today at a very, very high level. Um, and, and these are the networks that are deployed by all the CSPs, the communication service providers globally, whether it's Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile in the US or, or anybody in, uh, in Europe, uh, Middle East or Asia. And it starts, if we look at the slide from the left to the right, it starts with uh, the user devices, that's your smartphones, tablets, um, um, any, any wirelessly enabled um, device, and we call those the UE, the user equipment. Uh, they typically connect to a radio site, that's the, the antenna, the uh, radio module, baseband processing, uh, communication that, that handle the interface between the device and um, the network. Uh, and you would see those on the side of buildings, you see those as tall towers along the highways and, and so forth. Then there's typically a backhaul connection to a core network where a lot of the quality of service, mobility management, um, handoff uh, controls, as well as your authentication, billing, uh, and, and such core functions are handled. And this is, um, this is a very distributed network in the sense that you have a large number of radio sites, you have um, baseband processing and uh, modulation, demodulation capabilities, uh, in a much larger number of those sites, and then you have a very small number of very large core network elements. Uh, and you may only have uh, a couple of those core network sites per region, say in the US. And then from there you go through a transport network and you get out on the internet where you then access your access your your web service, your content applications, um, whatever whatever it may be. Uh, so it's a very in a in a sense it's a very distrib distributed network architecture uh, with local access points, radio sites, 
and then as you get uh, further away from the from the radio side, you start building these up into a very large uh, boxes that that handle thousands or millions of of subscribers. So when you think about that architecture and you think about what might be needed for a network on the lunar surface where you have a small geographical area that you need to cover with maybe 20, 100, maybe a couple hundred um, devices, whether it's astronauts or machines or sensors, it's, it's a little bit different architecturally, but you do need all the functions. Um, so one of the challenges is how do you build this network uh, architecture differently while still making sure you have all the components that are needed for establishing end-to-end -end voice video or, or data calls. Um, so that was that's essentially Kiri, the challenge. Uh, Kiri, we have some questions coming in. Uh, sure. from the, okay, so let me, uh, we've actually got four uh, questions, but mm -hmm. uh, let's take them one at a time. Uh, on your previous slide, uh, somebody remarked it's interesting, the the astronaut to astronaut and astronaut to lander seem like uh, V to V and V to I type communications. Is is Nokia visualizing it that way? Uh, it certainly uh, could be, and uh, we have a lot of V to V, V to I, V to N as well on terrestrial applications. If you think about, um, if you think about the autonomous vehicles or connected vehicles, I shouldn't say autonomous, but just connected vehicles in general. Um, so we think we think of an astronaut to lander as more of a V to N uh, communication because I'll put the the entire network maybe on the on the lander, so that's more of a V to N. Um, and then certainly when astronauts get uh, get, get far away from the lander, you would want to have maybe a V to V communication also for reliability and and redundancy. So uh, yes. Okay. Good. And then uh, okay, so more and maybe some of these are coming up later. Uh, so one question is, have frequency bands been selected for each use case? Uh, no, um, I think um, this is how we, this slide depicts the use cases that, that we envision. I think this is aligned also with um, NASA's ambition. If you think about, uh, if you read up on the LunaNet architecture, but what has not been done is assigning frequencies it's actually an interesting question that we faced on who controls the frequencies and how are frequencies allocated when you get to um to space so uh, i can talk a little bit more about that when i talk about our particular solution but uh the short answer to the question is no um there's no frequency plan for uh lunar surface communication at this point got it and no particular bands have been chosen for your network yet then uh, no, we uh, we have chosen a particular band for our network because we uh, we need a band to to deploy and build and operate the network. So we have chosen a particular frequency band, um, but you need to keep in mind our mission is really a, a demonstration mission to validate the technology. It doesn't suggest that the band that we've taken is is the band that will be used for commercial uh, deployments. Because uh, really, once we if we can build the network and demonstrate that it uh, works and we can overcome the specific challenges of uh, lunar surface communication, the particular frequency band does not actually matter that much. And if I can um, deploy and operate the network at one frequency band, um, it's very likely I can also deploy and operate it at a different frequency band if that's the choice that's made for more permanent deployments. Got it. Okay. Is it is it fair to ask, uh, even though you know this is deployable in any band or whatever for future applications, is it fair to ask what band are you actually going to use for this particular network? Uh, it's certainly fair to ask. I'm not sure that NASA would let me answer that question, but it's one of the uh, what's one of the um, one of the known cellular bands that we have on on Earth. Um, Okay. It's right, a um, below, below two gigahertz band. Got it. Just okay. That narrows it down. Um, okay. And then we have a question on what are the benefits of using LTE slash 4G or 5G technology compared to traditional space communication technologies? Uh, I think I, I would say there's, there's maybe several elements. Um, uh, I, I don't want to belabor the point of the investment and uh, the the, the future proofing of and the roadmap 
and the continued investment in the cellular uh, technologies from the telecom industry. But I think certainly uh, LTE, 4G, and then going into 5G, um, large capacity, um, very spectrally efficient technologies, um, as well as then low latency, uh, low latency communication and uh, mobility support, as well as quality of service uh, support. So really from a from a communication uh, performance perspective, I think the cellular technologies are, are certainly the, some of the most advanced technologies that we have. Got it. Okay, makes sense. Uh, all right, I'll keep going with the questions if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, okay, so, uh, and actually this question is something I would have asked. Um, so how do you do the coverage planning for the networks? Are there uh, lunar-based propagation models and how do you integrate those into a planning tool? And, and I would have also asked or made the, made the observation that the moon seems to be an ideal laboratory for calibrating terrain-based propagation models because you don't have any trees and buildings or a, you know that, that impact it. You also have no appreciable atmosphere or ionosphere. So it seems like, uh, and you know the dielectric properties of the lunar surface, it seems like is an ideal environment for calibrating uh, yeah. terrain-based propagation. So how, yeah, what what did you do with regard to propagation? If if that's okay with you, I'll I'll hold that question. I I do have a slide later on the on the propagation environment and the and Perfect. the work we've done on that. Perfect. And then one last observation from Kevin Gifford from CU Boulder. He chairs our passive active mm -hmm. spectrum sharing group. Uh, he just noted that frequency allocation is an international effort. Specific lunar surface allocations are under negotiation with ITU right now. So I'm sure you're yep. very involved in that. And then that's that's it. So we can continue on. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. So uh, so now uh, we get a little bit more into the the specific part of of the mission. Um, so back in October 2020, NASA selected us to uh, to deploy this and, and build this first cellular network on the moon. Um, we're partnering with two two companies uh, for this. Uh, the primary partner for us is a company out of uh, Houston called Intuitive Machines, and they built uh, really the um, called the Nova C uh, lander. They their um, commercial payload delivery company uh, supported by NASA, and they built the Luna lander uh, for us. So we're really just responsible for the communication part. They're responsible for payload delivery, and as part of our mission, uh, they will deploy the. The network, but they will also have other payloads on the on the same same mission at the same lander. We also partner with a company called Luna Outpost. Uh, that's a, a company out of Boulder, Colorado, that builds uh, Luna rovers. Uh, so that would be um, the terminal, essentially, where we put our, our user equipment, and that will connect back to the lander. Um, the uh, the primary objective is to uh, to deploy, and establish, and operate the LT network uh, on the Luna South Pole. Um, and the first part is to really verify that we can build a network that survives uh, launch, transit, landing uh, to the lunar surface so we can build a network that overcomes the harsh environment and the harsh conditions and just operate the network. That's the first uh, first objective. Second objective, and gets a little bit to, to the question, is can we validate performance of an LTE system, both in short range and long range communication. So understand throughput versus range um, and, and do measurements of throughput versus range uh, while we're communicating between the rover and the lunar lander. Um, so that gets already a little bit to the question of the propagation environment. Uh, and then ultimately, if we can build a network, we can deploy it, we can operate it, uh, and we can start measuring performance it will advance the technology readiness level of, of the network. Right now, before the mission, we consider we're at uh, TRL technology readiness level six or seven. Uh, NASA would want it to be at level nine and, and before it would be considered for, um, for, uh, for any commercial mission. So through operating this network in the real environment, we'll be able to advance it and validate really that these technologies that have not been developed initially for space communication can be made ready for space communication, can be adapted. Uh, and I think that's really the primary mission. So it's it's still a demonstration mission. Uh, it's targeted for one lunar day, so about 12, um, 12 days. 
um, the equipment and the lander will not survive lunar night. So it's really just a very small scale, very controlled mission to validate the basic capabilities of a, a cellular technology on the lunar surface. And, and I think by that, it will open the door to saying, if we can have this base capability validated and established, then you can certainly expand it from an architecture perspective. You can expand the network from a, from a coverage. You can expand it from a multi-node network. You can expand it to uh, additional um, additional use cases and scenarios and so forth. But the the big jump is really showing that you take technology that's been developed for terrestrial applications, and with relatively small effort, but a lot of innovation, we can we can adapt it for space communication. And um, and the target launch date for this mission is uh, is towards the middle uh, or second half of, of next year. Um, and uh, just on this slide, I'm showing you the uh, uh, the Onion um, wrote a short article uh, when it was announced. Uh, this obviously, when NASA announced that they selected us to build a network, uh, created quite a bit of buzz, uh, a lot of visibility on the on the project after NASA announced this selection and. Uh, we take it as a badge of honor that even the onion uh, picked up the story um, for this. So what are some of the key challenges that we need to address um, for this network? Uh, to be honest, the communication capability itself, uh, if, if, if I mean by that, uh, sending bits over, over a wireless interface is really not a challenge. We're not really touching that part. So anything related to um, the transmission itself, modulation, demodulation, coding, uh, decoding, all of that is, is very standard. Um, and, and that's the point that, uh, that we can reuse that as much as possible. A lot, of the a lot of the challenges that we have to address are really related to the environment and the, the operational conditions. And it starts, it starts really with the environment. First of all, you have to survive launch, transit, landing, and operation on the moon with all the environmental conditions, uh, acceleration, shock, vibration, temperature, and so forth. So a lot of our effort goes into the hardening of the system from, from that perspective, um, because those are more extreme conditions than uh, our networks face on a daily basis on, on Earth. Um, second one that's, that's really interesting is radiation. Uh, how do we protect uh, the equipment against radiation? And, and one of the things that we discovered is that the effect of radiation on equipment is that tends to lead to bit flips. And of course, if you have bit flips in your in your software, it can completely compromise the, the software and the operation of, of the, the system. And there are multiple ways that you can address that. You can address that with uh, spot shielding on your equipment. And, and, and that's what we're doing from a, from a mechanical perspective. But we're also looking at hardening the software um, from a from a software perspective and, and building redundancy, not every uh, piece of electronics equipment is equally susceptible to radiation. So if you look at different types of memories, some are more susceptible to the radiation effect than others. So it's it's there's some clever engineering that we're doing to figure out uh, in what type of memory should we store what kind of uh, piece of code. How do we have redundancy back built back in? How do we how do we recover from um, from um, from bit flips, how do we cover the software? Uh, how many copies of the software do we have, and, and so forth? So quite a bit of software um, reliability engineering that that we've done. Um, the other part that's that's really really important, and I touched on that at the beginning, is size, weight, and power are absolutely critical when you go to space. It's it's certainly desirable in a lot of terrestrial applications, but when you go to space, uh, every pound or kilogram of payload that you send into space costs a lot of money. So how do we build the uh, the hardware in the most compact form factor, uh, dimensioning it right to the needs and, uh, of the, and the capacity of the mission and the deployment is that commercial networks would support thousands or hundred thousands of, of users as far as the, the core network capabilities are concerned. Even if you look at just one radio site, the core network is is dimensioned for communication service provider networks, but that's overkill as far as this mission is concerned. So how do I take different network functionalities that are deployed in distributed and, and uh, separate network elements in a CSP network, how do I bring them together in one unit and how do I dim dimension it uh, just right for the, for the particular deployment that I have in mind here? 
and then how do we integrate that in the most compact form factor? Uh, so that's uh, that's absolutely uh, absolutely key, and a lot of the innovation goes into into that uh, uh, that part of the project. And then the final part is remote operation and remote control. Uh, as much as everybody on the team would volunteer to to go to the moon and and reboot the box if uh, if needed, the reality is this has to be completely autonomous deployment, has to be completely um, remotely managed, and uh, we have uh, telemetry data and we have control capabilities. But by and large, this network has to operate completely autonomously, and we have um, a relatively low throughput, long latency link between the equipment on the moon and Earth. So um, we have to be able to manage it uh, remotely from mission control while most of it is done autonomously on the on the lunar surface. Um, so as you see, when when we look, yeah, go ahead, so, please. Yeah, you know, uh, I thought you were finished with this slide. We have a couple of related questions on this slide. Mm -hmm. um, so sure. one was, uh, have you tested in an Earth analog type environment like the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah? Uh, yes, I'll uh, I'll get that uh, to that to that question as well. Not in Utah, but uh, another similar environment. Yes. Okay. And then the second question is, um, I mean, I know you said that the the system will operate for a lunar day; it won't survive the lunar night. Um, is there uh, is there a, a sort of a guaranteed shutdown after that, or could you have the situation where every time it's back into solar daylight or to lunar daylight? It uh, you know somehow comes to life and starts emitting again uh, as a spurious RF emitter. Um, we don't think the latter will be the case because the electronics will not survive lunar night, uh, and that's on our side as well as the lunar lander. Uh, the lunar lander is also not built to survive lunar night. So uh, uh, since our our system is 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 connected to the uh, to the power supply from the lunar lander. Uh, we we don't think that um, it would survive lunar night and then come back during lunar day uh, again. Got it. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, so what does this network look like when we when you talk about the Nokia LTE network for the moon? What does it look like? It has it has several components. If we look from the left to the right, um, the uh, we build a user equipment, and that's this little blue square box. Uh, that's essentially the equivalent of your smartphone. Obviously, it doesn't look like a smartphone, and we don't need a screen and, and apps and so forth, but it's the equivalent of um, uh, LTE user equipment that will go on the rover. Uh, and, and so that's a custom-built um, device that's, that's a little bit higher power than, higher power than your normal, um, normal uh, UE. We build in a new antenna that also goes on the uh, the rover. Uh, then you have the, uh, and I'm reading this left to right, then you have the, the wireless interface between the rover and the lander. And on the lander, we have a set of uh, two antennas that we deploy, omnidirectional antenna uh, that will be deployed on the lander. And then we have the main part of the system is this, uh, this rectangular box that's the entire LTE network. So that includes all the base transceiver functions, uh, power board, uh, filter board, uh, modulation, as well as the core network functionalities that would be in um, in different um, different devices, different network elements in the cellular network on Earth. So this is all integrated into this uh, this rectangular box. Um, Dimension-wise, you should think of this box as being half the size of a large pizza box, a little bit thicker. Uh, but the rectangular dimension are about half the size of a pizza box, and this is dual redundant. So there's actually two systems in in the box. So it would be um, half of this size would be an entire LTE network, and and that's quite um, impressive. If allow me to say that we take an entire LTE network that's much larger in, for commercial service provider deployment, and we manage to integrate this in in something that's uh, you know maybe the size of your laptop. Um, and then, uh, so this is this is mounted on the lander. This is connected to, uh, for power, it's connected to the power supply from the lander. But then it's also connected to the um, to the terrestrial link from the lander, uh, satellite link from the from the lander back to Earth, um, and then connected to mission control on Earth. And then we provide our software that runs both on the user equipment 
the network equipment as well as mission control for managing, monitoring, controlling um, the uh, the entire solution. So a question um, on a terrestrial LT network, you'd use GPS for timing. Uh, what do you use for lunar timing sync? Um, because we only have uh, one one uh, network, uh, we don't need the same. Uh, we don't need synchronization uh, as as much as you need it on the terrestrial network. Uh, so obviously, there's no GPS on on lunar surface, and and that's one of the simplifications we've taken on the software. We could remove all the uh, the GPS components from the from the system. Got it. Thanks. Uh, so a little bit on the deployment uh, scenario and, and a couple of cartoon pictures here. If you look at the top left, you can see how this would uh, be set up from a from a from a network perspective. You see the the lunar rover in the bottom left. You see the lander and the the right side of the the slide. So the LTE link is really between the rover and the lander, um, and then there's the direct link from the lander back to Earth. Um, and uh, and then this um, the lander um, so the mission uh, operations will be the lander lands on lunar surface the LTE network is activated oops uh, ah, going wrong way sorry the LTE uh, network is activated the rover is deployed the connection is established between the rover and the lander and then the rover will have um, a couple of missions uh, on the lunar surface uh, two missions that are related to communications. One is uh, sort of a short-range uh, driving around the lunar uh, the, the lunar lander. So imagine a, a small circle of a couple hundred meter distance from the lander that the rover would drive around, and we um, we monitor communication between the lander and the the rover. And then the long-range mission, where you can imagine the rover goes off on the distance, sort of on the linear trajectory, not quite linear. Uh, to see how far we can stretch the communication and monitor communication uh, performance with respect to distance between the rover and the lander. Um, and then as far as the, the picture on the right side is concerned, you see the, the Nova C lander, um, you see the antenna uh, on the lander, these two stub antennas at the top, the LTE BTS, uh, the, well, actually it's not just the BTS, it's the entire LTE network mounted on the outside of the um, the the lander uh including the thermal uh thermal solution which is this fin that you can see here sticking out um and then this brown box is what we call a garage and that's the garage where the rover will be housed during uh transit and landing and this box then uh opens up deploys the lander and our user equipment and the antennas that we de develop uh for the user equipment will be mounted on the on the rover and then the rover will start driving off from the from the lunar lander. As I said, the communication is between the lander and the rover, and then the the signal will essentially go from the lander from the rover to the lander, and then internally in the lander be connected to uh, the link back to Earth on the satellite. And and that part of the system is a responsibility of intuitive machines. So this is sort of the simplified system architecture. Look on the left side, you have the user equipment on the rover connect to the antenna, the red arrow is the LTE surface communication link between the rover and the lander, connect to the LTE equipment on the lander, and then it connects to the direct to earth communication link, connect to the ground station, and then we have software that runs both on the user equipment on the rover, on the um, network equipment on the lander, as well as the ground network. And there's a secondary uh, communication link for uh, redundancy between the rover and the lander and uh, um, other parties are responsible for that link we, we provide the the dark blue boxes are the hardware that we provide and the light blue boxes are the software and of course there's software also running on the user equipment and the the base station okay um if there are no other questions now i want to talk a little bit about what we've done from a testing perspective and i think there was uh, a, uh, a couple of questions in that direction so there's quite a bit of uh, of testing that we've done. We've we've actually already gone through two uh, two design cycles and two um, two full testing cycles. Um, so the way we've we've done this is is really quite iterative. Design the system, build it, go through a full suite of testing, which we call qualification testing, 
on multiple systems, um, any lessons learned, any design changes that we needed to make. Uh, and then we went through a second uh, run of building the system uh, or several systems. And then we, uh, we've gone through acceptance testing for, um, um, for the final, uh, final hardware and software. And then from those, from the acceptance testing, we then have chosen the, the flight units. Uh, each one of these test cycles is very extensive and uh, includes over 25 different tests that include um, the tests on acceleration, shock, vibration, uh, thermal, vacuum, uh, multi-packion, radiation. So really extensive testing that we do both in, in our labs. We have uh, reliability and compliance labs in, inside the company, inside Bell Labs, but also with external external test labs that have uh, capabilities that uh, that we don't have. So we've we've gone through the two cycles right now. Uh, fortunately, there were not a lot of changes that we needed to make after the first run. Um, so it was quite quite successful after the qualification testing. And we've completed acceptance testing uh, already and selected the flight units already. And uh, we're, we're still going through additional software testing um, the system's been running for several months uh, continuously in our lab uh, as far as end-to-end -end software testing is concerned and we've already started integrating the our software assets with the software assets of the partners and, and done um, what's called flat set testing on uh, in the lab of the end-to-end -end system so we're we're quite advanced and uh, let's say quite ready to fly this mission as far as our development and testing is concerned from a hardware and software perspective, uh, even though we still have um, a good uh, nine months or so before the actual mission. So we're quite, quite, uh, we're feeling quite ready. But of course, in this environment, you can never do enough testing. So we will test until the last, last day when, when we have to, uh, we have to stop. Um, Jerry, one uh, more question. Um, sure. It was a, it's a general question. Um, Actually, another one uh, just came in. So, is the design somewhat inspired by 5G non-terrestrial network design? No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. Um, I think it's it's really it's really inspired by how do I co-locate and integrate uh, different software elements on single single hardware platform. Uh, I think it has benefits for uh, non-terrestrial networks as well, and. Uh, but I think um, we didn't look at NTN architectures and, and draw from there. Uh, I think we've we've done a lot of work in the past on uh, on these compact networks that go into backpacks and so forth. So it's really really drawn from that um, that perspective. Got it. Okay. And then one other question: What are the sources of interference, if any, on the moon? Um, actually, that, that's a really good question. We're, uh, we're not aware of any interference that, that would, well, anything that would cause interference to us. Um, we have looked at potential interference with radio astronomy um, and, uh, and, and telescopes, but uh, given the distance between uh, Moon and, and, uh, and Earth, uh, we've done extensive testing and uh, we don't think that there's any interference uh, with We've done a lot of uh, calculations and, and studies on that. We've also reached out to the radio astronomy community and shared with them uh, what we're doing um, and um, and the uh, the emissions and so forth, and, and really uh, try to reach out to them proactively to make sure that they don't have any concerns and and there are no concerns at this at this point. Uh, I think it also goes a little bit to the spectrum question. Um, so we've we've been very proactive of working with NASA the FCC, ITU, and, and, and share with them what we're doing and, and make sure we get all the, um, the approvals and, and alleviate any, any concerns that, that anybody might have. Uh, it's, a, it's a much more important question to look at when we talk about permanent deployments um, and multiple nodes being deployed, maybe built by multiple people or different entities, and, and you have uh, larger scale deployments. Uh, but uh, right now, we don't, we don't uh, see any any particular concerns and, and nobody has voiced any concerns to us. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so now I want to talk a little bit about the RF propagation since I think uh, Andrew, you you asked about that and somebody else also asked about that. Um, so you, the, the question was, is it a good environment for RF propagation studies? And yes, in a sense, it's, it's a very 
very clean environment it's very um there, there are no buildings no trees so it's very uh very open uh on the other side you have boulders and craters and so forth uh and the typical propagation models that we have on earth don't quite apply because also the curvature of the moon is different from the curvature on earth but what we've done is we've we've developed a particular uh, propagation model um uh, and and then we we try to we use that to estimate the performance and range and coverage that we could get from the equipment um and and i'll show you in a second how we calibrated that model but one of the objectives uh for the mission is actually to to ver verify the model that we've built and by taking the actual measurements on the lunar surface uh we can further calibrate the model against actual um actual measurements um so we've we've done quite a bit of studies and what's interesting here is also this propagation study went into choosing the landing site. Uh, so while the mission was targeted for the lunar uh, south pole, the exact landing site was not not specified, and um, and we had some input into it, and and also the the particular mission that the rover will will drive. Having these propagation studies done helped us select the particular path that the rover will drive, and helped us select the landing site. Um, and, and so it's an interesting dynamic between the, um, the, the parties that are very focused on the landing and the, the space mission itself versus us as the communication expert and saying, if we want to do these kind of explorations, what, what are the pros and cons of different landing sites as far as the uh, DRF propagation environment is concerned? Um, so, uh, so we've done quite a bit of work. We have calibrated our terrestrial model um or we, we we rebuilt i shouldn't say calibrate we rebuilt our terrestrial model for the environment and and yes there are maps uh fairly detailed maps of of the lunar surface so that of course uh was one of the inputs that went into into the propagation study um but one of the things that we've done uh, and this this is also in response to one of the questions is back in 2019 um we took our system that we that we developed for the previous uh, mission with Vodafone and Audi, we took it to the island of Fuerteventura in Spain. And, um, and, and Fuerteventura has an interesting landscape. It, it looks a little bit, it's quite volcanic and it looks uh, somewhat moon-like. And so we deployed our entire network there uh, in exactly the same operating conditions that we've, uh, we have on the moon as far as the, uh, the network is concerned, the antennas are concerned, as well as the antenna height both the antenna height on the rover as well as the antenna height on the the network typically when you when you look at a service provider network the antenna might be 30 40 meters up in the air on the on the tree or side of a building that's not the case for this lunar lander so the antenna height is uh has, has a major major impact on the the range and the coverage that you get so we we set up this network in in exactly the same configuration that we would have on the lunar surface and then we have this um, this um, this robot that you see on the right uh, picture, and we uh, we started uh, deploying, connecting this robot, and remotely driving it. Uh, and we the so the person driving it only had um, the feed from the robot's uh, cameras, so no no other information. And remotely driving this robot, and we used that to do uh, several things. One, validate the entire system end to end. From a hardware software operations perspective, uh, we used it to also calibrate the um, the RF model against uh, the measurements that we're taking. So we took our Earth RF propagation environment and then calibrated against these measurements with the, the same antennas, the same uh, antenna heights that we have. So the model that we're now using for predicting the coverage on the lunar surface, that model is essentially being calibrated through this terrestrial uh, deployment. And uh, in that, that drive test, we also tried to drive as far as we could before we would lose the propagation signal and we could uh, could still maintain acceptable video transmission up to uh, or a little bit over five kilometers from the from the base station. So while we're doing all these different tests in the, in the labs and in the test chambers, uh, we've also done this end-to-end -end system test um, in uh, it wasn't Utah, but it's a, a similar um, terrestrial network that has uh, similar moon moon-like uh, characteristics. 
Okay, and uh, I think I'll I'll stop there. I uh, I just want to summarize that this is uh, this is certainly my career is one of the most exciting projects that I've been been part of. Uh, personally, kind of Mary's work um, is one of the challenging engineering research uh, uh, endeavors that we have, but also personal interest. Uh, I'm I'm a little bit of a space geek, so I kind of uh, very excited about leading this project and. And getting to uh, to do something in an area that I never thought of uh, doing research on, um, quite a bit of challenges. Not the challenges where you would necessarily expect them, because uh, a lot of the communication is fairly standard. But a lot of challenges from hardware, software, system design, testing, um, integration, and then working with a set of really great partners that that have their parts uh, that contribute to it, and and just just engaging with people that are coming from a different industry, speak a different language. Uh, it's just a very uh, very gratifying and, and very exciting project. And, and we're looking forward to um, continuing to finish our, our testing, um, integration on the, on the flight uh, vehicle, and then the actual mission. And, uh, and I, uh, I'll pause here and just say I'll be, be happy to, uh, to come back in, in a year or so after we we finish the mission and uh, and share with you uh, lessons learned after the mission. With that, maybe I'll I'll stop here and see if there are any more questions or comments or thoughts. Uh, we'll look forward to having you uh, next year. That would be great. Uh, we do have one more question that came in. We saved the most technical question for last. Um, was the amplifier in the BTS designed as a Doherty amplifier, and did it use a gallium nitride transistor? Uh, I will have to uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. I uh, I don't remember the uh, know the detail at, at that level on top of my head. I'll um, I'll get back to you on that. Okay. Uh, another question just came in. Could the hardware could the hardware be hardened for high power microwave and millimeter wave exposure? These are being considered for power beaming, beaming mining, and construction. Um. Different from radiation level. Yeah, I, I would have to look at that. Um, I, I don't. I don't think we've looked at it, but uh, I would say in principle, yes. Um, but but we haven't looked at that particular requirement. Got it. Okay. Another observation: reflective intelligence surfaces, uh, or RIS, may exhibit interesting outcomes. Just an observation on the lunar mm -hmm. surface. And I think that is it, unless there are any other questions. We're running a couple of minutes over the over time, so I think that's that, it. That's all the questions I'm seeing on the interface. Uh, okay, great. Thanks, Lee. Uh, Dr. Klein, thank you very much uh, for a very interesting presentation. Um, the slides will be available, uh, hopefully, online. We'll talk to you about that, Dr. Klein, if that's okay with you. Um, yeah. But uh, that was a great presentation. We thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for uh, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate everybody uh, taking time today to uh, to join the webinar, and I hope you found it uh, exciting and uh, and interesting. Yep. Thank you. We will listen again. Yep. Thank and thanks again for everybody for joining. So thank you, and we'll see you when we schedule our next Tech Talk webinar. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys.